Hello, my name is Logan. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? A lot of, this is like way more people than I thought. So, so uh, you guys get to watch me humiliate myself on stage. Have so much fun. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about introduction to machine learning. Um, before I get into that, uh, this is a little bit about me. Um, freshman college dropout, and I mentioned that for a very specific reason for this talk that we'll come back to. Uh, I've been doing software engineering for over 10 years. I do full stack and DevOps. I moved from uh, Utah to Pennsylvania at uh, the beginning of last year. I live up in Lebanon, still getting used to things like being stuck behind a tractor and traffic. That's a little new for me. Um, really enjoy D&D, uh, video games, traveling, cooking, baking, uh, anything that's like creative and like mind uh, engaging. And I'm currently getting into machine learning and AI, as in, that is my current thing I'm trying to learn, which leads me to my next slide, of my caveats. Uh, they say the best way to learn something is to teach something, and I vibe really well with that. So I've been learning, and now I'm up here teaching you, and so quick raise of hands of anyone who like does machine learning either professionally or as like a side project. Like you have more experience than just uh, typing into ChatGPT. Anyone? Ish, ish, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 just, just a little more than that. Okay, somehow that makes me feel better. But uh, if for some reason I misspeak or I'm talking about something wrong, please correct me. I welcome the feedback. Um, this is kind of what I've been learning over the past couple of months. And uh, quick note of transparency, originally I was supposed to do this talk in June, so I thought I had more time. So this is scraped together. Um, these are the references. If you want to get more into uh, machine learning and AI that uh, I actually would really recommend. We are not going to do any code examples today. I'm sorry. We're going to keep things kind of conceptual, um, talk about uh, how, you know, what a model is, what a neural network is, talk about tokens, because we hear about them a lot, right? You hear about like, oh, the model was trained to do this, or like, Oh, ChatGPT now supports 700,000 tokens or whatever. And you're like, cool. What does that mean? And everyone's like, oh, it's, seven, it's 700,000 tokens. You're like, cool. Oh, OK. Sure. Awesome. All right. So first off, let's start, what is machine learning? Uh, traditional programming, which you all may or may not be familiar with, is very much like you define a set of rules and business logic, and then you give it data, and then it gives you answers, right? So uh, my favorite example is always to go back to an e-commerce store, because that's my background, and that's, I think, pretty universally uh, relatable. But it's that you write business logic, and you say, OK, when a product is in stock, user adds it to cart, go to checkout, charge their card, you have all this business logic, whatever. Answers is, cool, product ship. Machine learning kind of turns that upside down in that you give it the data and the answers and it tries to figure out what the rules are. What's the relationship? What is it that you, how do you actually get from point A to point B? Um, so kind of the, the illustration at the bottom is give it answers and data and it spits out rules. Let's talk about models. Um, this, we have two arrays. We have an X and a Y. Uh, can anyone tell me what the relationship is between them? That's true, and also linear. Uh, the, the general relationship between the two points is Y equals 2X minus 1, right? That's, this is as mathematical as we're going to get. Remember the college dropout portion? Anyone can do machine learning even people who fail at calculus three times. <laughs> All right, uh, cool. So let's talk about neural networks. Remember the 2x minus 1. We're going to come back to that. So you often see these little diagrams representing a neural network or a machine learning model, right? What does that actually mean? Um, it's comprised of layers of neurons. And the columns are the layers, and the little circles are the neurons, OK? Uh, each neuron has a random weight and a bias to use in its calculations, which we're going to come back to and like why that matters and, and how that's used. Uh, it takes the output from uh, one neuron and actually passes it to every neuron in the following layer. 
Um, and again, we'll get more into kind of what that looks like. The final output of the final uh, layer, these arrows on the right, is the model. So you put in a bunch of data, it does a bunch of stuff, spits out a model. Uh, the model's a prediction, and that is like, I just want to kind of underscore that here. And the machine learning is all about predicting what's going to come next. Uh, okay, coming back to my, by raise of hands, how many of you have just used ChatGPT in any context? Great, okay, hold on, keeping those hands up. Uh, keep your hand up if you gave it a question and it actually didn't answer it the right way. Okay, that's pretty much everyone. All right, uh, yeah, so it's a prediction, right? It's not guaranteed to be right. It doesn't know what's fact and what isn't, and we're gonna get into why that is. So, training data. Uh, data needs to be modified so that it represents kind of a data answer relationship, right? At the very beginning, we said machine learning, you give it data and answers, and it spits out rules. So our two arrays then become uh, this set of data underneath, and uh, this is a notation in machine learning where this is kind of your data set, and this uh, last element is either, uh, sometimes it's called a label, sometimes an answer, but like that's what you're expecting to get. So you feed it uh, one, you expect to get three. You feed it two, you expect it to get five, et cetera. Okay, so neurons job. So great, we have data and answers, and we know that neurons pass stuff onto layers, but what do the actual neurons do? Uh, these are called, they have, they have different jobs, called activation functions. This is where the calculus and the heavy math come in. Uh, they introduce, they're called non-linearities into the calculation so the model can, so it can model more complex scenarios. Meaning that uh, one of you pointed out that the two arrays were both linear, right? They both just increased in a line and it was like, that was that. Being, or introducing these these non-linearities using the random uh, weight and bias that I mentioned earlier actually gives it a random variance so it can test more than just the one happy path, right? So it can say, okay, how far off can these predictions be while still being correct? Um, anyway, so these neurons have jobs called activation functions. A couple act like common activation functions. Um, there's ReLU, which just returns it's weird, it's, it's your value if it's positive or zero, right? Um, similarly, you know, often activation functions are represented as this little uh, mathematical formula here where it's uh, pass in, you know, to the optimizer function, which we'll get to, uh, the, the random weight times the input that you give it plus the random bias. Great, so what does that actually mean, right? So each neuron executes calculations n number of times. Uh, they're called epics. So it'll run one formula with random weights and biases, let's say 500 times. Then it's gonna measure the actual uh, variance between what it came up in its calculations and what the answer was that it provided. So in this example, right, we have our example arrays off to the right. Um, so what if the neuron said like, oh, 10x minus 10, that's my guess is the relationship. Okay, well if x equals two, then y would be 190, except y equals five when x equals two. So the loss value is 188. And you use this loss value, you can plot it, you can track it, you can use it in kind of your algorithm to tweak as you go along. So if you say, hey, the loss value is huge, that is like, so the wrong answer, let's correct it and tone it way, way, way down. So it might go like, okay, 10x minus 10 was crazy, let's try 3x minus three, and the loss value is gonna be smaller, so it's gonna know, okay, it's, it's closer to the right track. Um, and then these labels just at the top are like the different uh, jobs and, and whatnot that the neurons can provide or do. Okay, so like I said, it takes that loss value and it applies it to an optimizer function. And this is what does the actual math of like, hey, how do we get closer to it? Uh, it's, it's responsible for adjusting the weight and uh, the weight of the neuron in that author, or uh, not authorizer, that function to lower the loss value. So you actually see uh, this graph on the right is measuring the loss value. Um, the blue line is the loss, so as it goes on, 
uh, it'll actually decrease and at some point start to flatten out. Um, and then the, the orange line is the, um, the value loss, so like the, the value that it's using to kind of adjust that, that loss value, right? Okay, so what does that result look like? Right. So given our x and y values that we previously, previously established was 2x minus 1, uh, the model can make statistical predictions of what the relationship between them is. So because of the random weights and biases, each neuron will come up with different results. It tracks the loss value and then goes from there, right? Eventually, it'll land on what it predicts the relationship to be. Again, prediction, it's not guaranteed, uh, which could look something like this. Uh, I'm not going to read that, but you can see it's very, very close to 2x minus 1. It's not exact, but it's close. And it's interesting because on the, because of the random weights and biases, every time you run that training model or run that training data through the uh, network, it'll come up with a slightly different variation of that, right? It may end in 627 instead of 953, but it'll be, it'll be close, right? Okay. So like I said, uh, that's what the, that's the model. So everything has outputted, this is the model, which is roughly 2x minus 1. Um, and if we wanted to use that model, we would just take the input and put it in, and it would do that math for us, right? And output and say, like, hey, here's your y. OK. So to, so to sum up models, right, simply put, it's, it's just a statistical formula to predict an output given a certain input. Right? That's all, like under the hood, under all the glamour, right? AI and machine learning are just really complicated statistics. Um, and if any of you have taken stats in college, it's like that, but like way crazier. Um, and I, this, this latter part, okay, so it's derived by, the, the model's derived by a machine using complex algorithms to tactfully brute force the answer. And I put it that way because more complex operations are going to take longer because it's trying to adjust itself as it goes on and it's trying to say, like, what values can I tweak on my own to then get the appropriate answer, right? Or at least come in with an acceptable loss rate. Um, Anyone questions on models before we go to tokens? Yes. So in your uh, admittedly stereotypical uh, diagram of a, of a neural net, where uh -huh. you have layer upon layer of neurons, yep. uh, I, I always see them where there's the first layer has the most neurons, and mm -hmm. you know, reducing to, you get to the model. Is that mm -hmm. just a stereotypical representation of like, now we have a more correct prediction of the model, or is that necessarily it's, it's, it's a great question. It's not necessarily how they need to work. It is, as you put it, very stereotypical, right? Because each layer has a different job, and depending on the compute needs of that job and like what kind of information it needs, you may need to do additional transformations before or not, right? Maybe it's like, oh, hey, I just want to weed out all the negative numbers out of this extremely variant graph, right? So I want to do a ReLU job on the one before it, but the one after that is really computational heavy. You may want more neurons to like speed up the process. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? That's a good question. Uh, okay. So, let's talk about tokens. What does a token even mean? Seven hundred thousand of them. That's so many. It's like uh, a quick anecdote. Before uh, LLMs and ChatGPT and whatever, every time I heard token, I always thought of those Chuck E. Cheese arcade tokens. You guys know what I'm talking about? I think I still have one buried in a box somewhere as like a momentum. I don't even know if that business is still open anymore, but whatever. All right. So to talk about tokens, we have to talk about memory. When you store something in memory, it is not actually that thing, right? So if I were to store the letter L, it actually gets stored in memory as the ASCII representation 76. So listen, the word listen uh, in its ASCII form is, you know, 76, 73, 83, 84, or 69, 78. Uh, those represent a sort of a token for characters. 
A little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, so couldn't we, in theory, do the same for whole words? Maybe instead of uh, characters, we wanted to look at them from a words basis. So I love my dog and I love my cat becomes one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, five. And that's tokenization. Uh, it's, you're simply encoding a set of words into a sequence of numbers. Um, models will then take these similar to how we showed with the uh, two arrays and will basically take them and predict what comes next in, in the uh, sequence. So if I wanted to guess the next word in the phrase, I love my blank, and I gave it these three sentences as training data from three different people, right? Two people said the word dog. So what your tokens end up looking like are one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, four. Again, there's that uh, notation that denotes that's the answer we're looking for, right? Um, so then the result would be dog. Statistically, you are more, more likely to say, I love my dog, uh, given this training set. So when you are doing like iMessage or composing an email or whatever, and you see the suggested text and you gotta hit tab to like enter it in, that's what it's doing. Right, is it saying like, cool, I've taken and tokenized the words that you've just written, what's the most likely to come after? Okay, and this, this all works off of a corpus. A corpus is essentially a dictionary for models, right? Uh, you feed it in a bunch of text, a bunch of sentences, it'll tokenize all of them, it'll go through and uh, understand patterns based off of the corpus that you give it. It's interesting though, because when you work with uh, text in machine learning, you actually want to strip out a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't hold a lot of meaning. It may make sense grammatically, but it doesn't have meaning, right? Um, when you learn other languages, uh, German and Russian are great examples where they take out uh, some of the articles, right? So it's either D, or excuse me, the, and uh, I, or that one, it's just like that. Uh, machine learning does something similar because it messes your corpus up and it messes up your patterns. If you expect an and to come after a lot of words, then it may not predict it correctly if you're trying to just end the sentence there. So when you're creating a corpus, you want to clean up a lot of that stuff up. Uh, you want to take out articles, you want to take out punctuation, because punctuation actually will mess it up too if you put um, I love my dog period instead of just I love my dog no punctuation. That counts as two different tokens, right? And when really it means the same thing. So you strip that out. Um, I put off to the right, there are actually a, a ton of open source text models if you wanted to just like say, how do I ingest a ton of text all at once? Uh, Stanford has actually got a couple of them. Wikipedia has released numerous texts. In fact, you can get, you can download the whole of Wikipedia. Uh, this like machine learning model friendly. It's only like four gigabytes or something. It is way smaller than I thought it was going to be. Um, and IMDb actually provides a model too if you wanted to ask about like actors and movies and such, which is kind of fun. How well can you see that? Oh, good. Okay. Um, so here's kind of the overall process combining what we learned about models and what we learned about tokens. Where you take your corpus, uh, your dictionary, and you tokenize anything if, if, that's n if it's not already tokenized. You feed that into a neural network, your neural network goes ahead and churns and does a whole bunch of like complicated math and it determines patterns. Then uh, the, it outputs a model which then can predict what comes next. So then you give it a string of or uh, excuse me, you give it an input string and it'll then tokenize that input string and it'll look at those tokens and say, where have I seen this token pattern before? What comes next? And so it'll find the most likely value to fit that relationship of tokens. Okay, any questions before I br very briefly touch on LLMs? Fantastic, this is going much smoother than I thought it was going to, so. <laughs> You guys are a great crowd. Okay, LLMs are like text models on like a way, 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 way bigger scale, right? They're called a large language model for a reason. Um, funny enough, LLMs actually are not image-based. They are purely text-based. 
so anytime you see um, like Dolly or like any Sora, I think is another one, um, they're using a different type of model to generate images. But LLMs basically look at billions of uh, pieces of training data, of parameters, of you know, basically the, the world as a whole instead of your narrow window for a typical machine learning model, um, and gives you what it thinks fits the pattern of what you're trying to say, right? Or trying to, to glean from it. Um, LLMs were not really a thing prior to 2017, right? In 2017, uh, there's a new machine learning architecture that came out. It's called transformer architecture. Has a bunch of stuff, or a bunch of cool stuff about embeddings and parallelism and uh, stuff called feed-forward neural networks. A um, lot of really technical stuff. I don't have time to get into it tonight, nor do I want to. Uh, but they're really cool. You should go check them out. Um, oh wait, before we get to the not fun part, um, the other thing about LLMs, and Ken, you might be going into this too, but there's something called a RAG model that you can use to easily customize stuff. So a lot of LLMs you can put stuff on top of to like better customize to your business's needs or your personal needs, right? Um, and that just basically really fine tunes those patterns for you. Um, the final note I'll say about machine learning is I've, I've chosen my words very deliberately in that it predicts. It doesn't actually understand what it's saying. It, can, it just tells you, this is what I think you want to see. Um, and I think for those of you that have used ChatGPT probably more than once, you've probably pick that up of like, okay, you're telling me what you th think I want to know, but not actually what I want to know. So it's important to keep in mind. Um, finally, quick note on ethics, right? This is a very hotly contested thing. Um, there are lots of ethical considerations around bias, around discrimination, around plagiarism, around scraping you know, copyrighted content, um, around using it to um, sort of cut people out of either their skill set or jobs or whatever. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that other than just think before you code. And th this can really be applied to anything, but specifically with AI and machine learning. Just like think, you know. Anyway. Don't try to cut out artists with AI generated art. It's not. Anyway. Uh, and I will end with my favorite quote about AI from IBM in the 1970s, a computer can never be held accountable, therefore a computer must never make a management decision. And with that, thank you. Thank you. No one called me out of my shit, which is what I was really worried about. Oh yeah, questions. Yeah, Sorry. Question. Uh, do you know anything like how with, uh, Chelsea, the words? So this gets into embeddings a little bit, but uh, misspelled words count as a different token. But you can do these things called embeddings, which are you can tell it this word is the same as this word. So token six equals token seven, and so when you read those, like count them as the same thing. But when you first tokenize them they will be different. Similar to how like, um, if you spell the con it's, the contraction of it is, uh, with and without an apostrophe, that'll count as two different tokens. Now in that case, they are two different meanings, but the machine doesn't know that. No, neural network is, it's a, it's a concept that is like cornerstone to a lot of machine learning, right? So you have things like convolutional neural networks, you have the feed forward neural networks that was mentioned there at the end. It's, it's a type of model that's not necessarily um, like one of the other. Are there other ways to train machine learning? Probably, I don't know that.
No. Right, right, and, and that's a great question. So the, for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, the question was like, hey, you know, neural network's one way to train data. There are other ways, um, such as linear regression and, and others. And is there an advantage of one over the other? And this is gonna sound like a cop-out answer, but it's the same answer to any software architectural decision, and it is, it depends, right? Yeah, so uh, Because this is what I was taught, <laughs> this is the short answer. I don't know enough about the other ones to speak to them. Does that answer your question? <laughs> no, I don't have enough bias nor care enough to really give a real answer. <laughs> My answer is do your own research and pick what's best for you. <laughs> and then do a talk on it. Sorry, that wasn't a better answer. Next talk, why, why does no one not use <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so English major, my apologies, but. Uh, You're forgiven. Can teach true tokenization bad of there, where like, for like uh, multiple meanings for the same word, or homophones, or yes. word is for the same word, just mm -hmm. means different things. Mm -hmm. um, that gets a little bit kind of into the embedding similar to like misspelled words. Okay. Um, so, ugh, I hate to use it, but it's so universal at this point. Chat GPT, if you say, um, hey, I'm looking for uh, a character, right? And it's like, oh cool, I'm gonna pluck a random character out of nowhere, right? Here's Han Solo, right? And it's like, okay, cool, sorry, not a fictional character, I'm looking for an ASCII character. Yeah. And it's like, that totally changes the context. Um, it's, that, that feeds into different ways that you can tweak that model and tweak that corpus to say like, hey, uh, this token, say character, right, the token for the word character, right, right. Um, it follows patterns generally this way, which is how I got to Han Solo, but when you also mention ASCII or you also give it clarification, it'll look, say, oh, there's that token in this pattern as well. So then find me patterns that have both tokens and it'll basically contextualize it that way. Gotcha. You can use embeddings and you can use rags and you can use other things to like further give it purpose, but that's like the first step of this is how it would differentiate. Yeah. Would that be Yeah. It's the word it, and that's it. I, that's tricky, because I think it would go back to, it depends on the token pattern. Yeah. Because again, it, it can't derive meaning, right. right? You can't just say like, what is it in the previous, it's gonna be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, but, uh, I don't know. The vector is the sequence of tokens. Mm. If two things have similar meanings, then it's similar in that matter. find things that are similar based on the data yeah. that yield similar predictions. Right. It doesn't know right. any of that. It's right. just predicting. Hence the like, let me ask you a question with a, a character named like Fibonacci. And it's like, oh, I know that sequence, even though like I might not be asking the question at all about right. the Fibonacci sequence. Right. It's like, yeah, it's fucked up. Yep. All right, cool. Something. Maybe. I almost got off scot-free without you guys calling me out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, if you have more questions, you can take them up with Logan Oxworth, and we will be back in about 10 minutes. How long more can we go? Cool.